The ruble in freefall, Russia's currency plunges further as oil prices continue to dive. But is oil the only reason? What will this mean for the Russian economy? And what could be the political fallout? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. For months now, the Russian ruble has appeared to be in terminal decline. And on Monday, the currency plunged a further 10% against the US dollar. Now, this means the ruble has now lost almost 50% of its value against its US counterpart this year alone, earning it the dubious honour of being the world's worst performing currency of 2014. Now, in an effort to shore it up, the Russian central bank raised the interest rate to 17%, a move that could have a devastating effect on the Russian economy. But Russian economists are faced with an uncomfortable truth, that the economy is only as strong as the price of oil. Moscow brings in 50% of its budget from oil and natural gas sales. And as the value of oil has dropped this year, so too has the ruble. Well, it's not only the dramatic fall in oil prices that's hurting Russia's economy. Russia's finance minister recently said the country was losing $100 billion a year because of the decline in oil revenue. But he also says another $40 billion is being lost as a result of Western sanctions. Now, the instability has spooked investors and Russia has seen a flight of capital as a result. OK, let's get the thoughts now of our guest. Joining us in London is Timothy Ash, who's Head of Emerging Markets Research at Standard Bank in London. In Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer, Defence Analyst and Columnist at Novaya Gazeta. And completing our panel in London is Martin McCauley, Russia Specialist at the University of London and author of the book The Rise and Fall of the Soviet Union. Welcome to you all. Timothy, uh, can I start with you? And uh, first of all, can you explain explain to us what is this sharp hike in interest rates uh, being uh, levied by the central bank of russia what is it designed to do well yesterday we saw a huge move in one day in the exchange rate 10 percent on the day is is unprecedented and when that you see that kind of move i think there are real concerns about the systemic strength of the, the whole financial sector so the central bank had to do something to try and shore up confidence you raise rates, essentially, you deflate the economy. Uh, one of the problems, as you mentioned, is oil prices. Uh, lower oil prices mean less current account receipts, less receipts from exports, and it creates a bit of a hole in the balance of payments. Now, if you raise rates, you slow the domestic economy down, you reduce the demand for imports, you, you try and reduce that external financing gap. So, you know, they've been forced to push the economy deeper into recession to try and shore up ultimately demand for rubles. I mean, that's the, uh, the measure. I mean, 650 basis points, a, an enormous move. Uh, and the problem is it hasn't worked. I mean, we saw the ruble today uh, going up to 80 against the dollar. Absolutely remarkable that such a large move didn't really stabilize the exchange rate. And uh, Martin McCauley, um, all the signs are then that we are facing a crisis in the Russian economy. Uh, the decision to raise the interest rate was taken in the dead of night, wasn't it? Yes, and it's very, very peculiar because uh, Russia has uh, foreign currency reserves of over $400 billion. Its budget is more or less in, uh, in balance. Uh, its sovereign debt is only 10%. So it's very, very difficult to understand why this country is suffering uh, this attack on the ruble. Why is the currency going down so fast? Uh, it's very, very difficult to understand because on the face of it, uh, Russia is OK. Uh, they don't have tremendous amount of uh, foreign debt. Uh, and they have reserves. Now, will the uh, central bank then spend a lot of that money um, on trying to uh, save the ruble or, or protect the ruble? Uh, as Timothy has said, even putting the rates up to 17, the borrowing rates up to 17 percent, it hasn't stopped the fall of the ruble. Uh, and one goes back to 1998 uh, for something similar. It's quite extraordinary that a country in this situation is suffering this, these blows because in 1998 uh, the country is basically bankrupt, uh, very few uh, reserves and so on. But now they've got 400 billion dollars so, and a lot of oil 
uh, they can export uh, a lot of oil and so on, one of the major producers and so on. So uh, on the face of it, it's extremely difficult to understand why this crisis has occurred at this moment. Interesting that you should uh, go back to 1998. Of course, that's the time when Russia defaulted on its debt. But Pavel, can I come to you in Moscow? Um, how is it then for the Russian man and woman on the street? How are they experiencing this economic crisis? Uh, well, right now, most are kind of dazed by what is happening. Uh, there are, of course, people who took, uh, say, uh, uh, our denominated mortgage and now, of course, are just simply going bankrupt. And the problem is there, was, there is no such thing as personal bankruptcy in Russia. They wanted to pass a law, but they didn't actually pass a law. Uh, and, of course, the, the real... Uh, tidal wave of this crisis has not yet really struck the man in the street, the households. Uh, but it is coming and it will be coming very hard and it's going to be very unpleasant uh, because we're going to have a decline in uh, GDP, we're going to have double dig uh, digit inflation, so it's going to be hard for the people. They underst everyone understands that because, of course, uh, not only the ruble is falling, uh, the Russian stock exchange is falling. There's an enormous sellout. Investments are, uh, investors are just simply dumping uh, Russian stock, uh, taking the rubles, uh, exchanging them on dollars at any moment rate, and br taking the money out of Russia. And uh, so stopping that tidal wave is very uh, hard and uh, so it's a uh, it's I mean this is a kind of ideal storm a number of very negative factors came together to create this uh, situation. And uh, Timothy uh, coming back to you are we being rather precipitous then in judging this interest rate hike as having failed is there not a, a longer period of time by which we can actually measure the success or indeed the failure of it? I'm sorry, but a central bank that sees a 10% drop in its currency in a day raises rates and you see another more or less 10% uh, devaluation in a day. I mean, it's sadly failing. I mean, I think going back to what Martin said, I mean, uh, you know, the Russian central bank has over 400 billion in reserves. They've got plenty of reserves to deploy. One of the problems is they went to float the currency about a month ago promised that they had plenty of reserves and they were use, willing to use the, the bazooka of FX intervention, and then they didn't. They just stepped back. And people are, you know, it, the central bank has had its hands tied behind its back, in my mind. I mean, it wasn't really able to use rates initially. And, it, and I think the Kremlin told the central bank not to waste foreign exchange reserves because of the geopolitical backdrop. I mean, all the problems with Russia and Ukraine and the difficult relationship between Russia and the US and the West... I think in Moscow the feeling is this is going to go on for a long time and that foreign exchange reserves are the new strategic assets. So you have a central bank trying to defend the exchange rate but it can't use its exchange reserves and the market knows that and that's the reason the currency is going weaker and they didn't want to raise rates because last week we saw a 100 basis point rate rise which wasn't enough. They come back with 650 and because they didn't do it the first time the market doesn't believe them. So the problem is at the moment the central bank really doesn't have any credibility left and that's a serious problem for a central bank when it's fighting a, a currency crisis, and when you Pavel, have an underlying reason for currency weakness. Um, Pavel, thank you for that, Martin, but, uh, Timothy, rather. Um, Pavel, coming back to you, you've described or alluded to a, a, the perfect storm, a, a, a matter of capital flight, uh, sanctions being imposed uh, from the West, and indeed, of course, those uh, low oil prices. Um, are you getting a sense of, the, of an economic policy resulting from this coming out of the Kremlin in order to free up uh, the central bank, as uh, Timothy was referring to, to allow it perhaps to dip into its, uh, its currency reserves? Well, they have been actually selling reserves. They've, been, they've sold uh, tens of billions of dollars worth of, uh, to keep the ruble floating. It's not floating. Uh, they raise um, the exchange rate, and of course, that's everyone understands that's going to result in uh, GDP fall. That means people, the investors are selling Russian stock. Uh, they, 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 they raise the rate basically to dry up uh, ruble liquidity, for there will be less rubles for, to spe for speculators to buy dollars. But these are not speculators, these are investors that are uh, bailing out of Russia. So what's and the plan? So the more the central what's bank the raises the, uh, the rate, 
Uh, right now, I'm afraid they don't have a plan. The central bank is uh, doing all the, uh, what it can, but it has limited uh, capabilities. It's not a political body. Uh, the Russian prime minister rec in a recent big interview said basically that we should sort of weather the storm, sit and wait, and everything is going to be fine. Well, that's not a really good policy at all because that's no policy whatsoever. And uh, Martin McCauley, coming to you now, how do typically Russians react in a situation of economic crisis? I'm thinking in Western uh, countries, in Western economies, the first thing a population will do is vote out the government. How will Russians react? Russians will hunker down and, as somebody said, uh, circle the wagons and uh, stay until the storm has passed. The Russians are used, think about Russia over the last hundred years. They felt themselves to be under threat under the communist regime until 1991. They saw a tremendous threat from the West, from America and so on. And it was a siege mentality, if you like. Uh, so Russia has lived with this for a very, very long time. And if you listen to President Putin, Vladimir Putin, he brings this up time and again. He's very angry. He's a very angry and disappointed man about the way the West behaves. He sees the West as challenging Russia, as trying to uh, uh, reduce Russia to pygmy so that uh, they can dominate, uh, they can interfere in the Russian economy, and they can force regime change. They can force American democracy on Russia and so on. So Putin will say to his people, look, we're under siege. Uh, whom do we blame? We blame the Americans, we blame the money markets, uh, all those uh, capitalists out there, they're trying to destroy us. Uh, let's then come together and uh, fight this and we will show them that we can survive on our own. Russia is enormously, potentially enormously rich country. All they've got to do is to release that potential and get the economy going. But at present, it's dominated by a small group of oligarchs and others. Uh, and they are the ones who are, will be putting pressure on, 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 on Putin. And uh, Pavel, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, continually enjoys phenomenal uh, approval ratings, doesn't he? Around about the 70% mark. How far do you think the economy and the economic situation of the ordinary Russian plunge before that situation changes, before they turn on their government and, and what they would consider to be the economic mismanagement? Well, I believe that Putin is right now politically more or less secure. I don't believe that uh, even when in the coming year, uh, several months, it's a sure thing that this uh, uh, financial crisis is going to hit the population very seriously. Uh, still, he enjoys a, rather a, pop, a lot of popularity. But I also believe that it's highly possible that heads are going to roll, that Putin is going to find some scapegoats uh, inside his government, and it's also possible that his prime minister and former president, Dmitry Medvedev, may become a scapegoat and uh, will be ousted and some someone new will be introduced. Of course, Putin, and, and again, someone who could bring any kind of plan to get out of this very serious situation. It could be a military kind of inclined person like Sergei Shaigu, the very popular defense minister, or the former finance minister uh, uh, Kudrin, Alexei Kudrin. But so the names have been named. But of course, that's all in Putin's hands. He has to decide will heads roll and whose head is going to roll. But there is already a lot of anger, at least in the uh, Duma, and there will be more anger in the population in the coming months. And uh, Timothy, the central bank, has al already warned that the economy is uh, likely to contract by 4.5% in 2015. And that uh, prediction was based upon the calculation of $60 per barrel of oil. We're already looking at uh, the price of a barrel of oil way below that. The central bank is obviously going to have to recalculate, recalibrate its predictions. Well, also, I think the $60 oil forecast in the 4.5% uh, recession uh, also didn't take into account to a 650 basis point uh, rate hike. So, so maybe a 4.5% recession might be a bit optimistic. But, I mean, at the moment, the central bank is, is really, it's in crisis, crisis uh, mode, trying to simply stabilise the exchange rate. But, you know, as long as oil prices continue to go lower, as long as the central bank is constrained in terms of using foreign exchange reserves and doesn't really want to raise interest rates again, 
you know, the ruble will remain vulnerable in, uh, on the downside. And a weaker ruble creates big systemic question marks throughout the economy in terms of the banks, in terms of default risk in corporates and uh, banks and at the micro level. Uh, you know, it's very, very challenging for the Russian authorities, no doubt about it. And there's some suggestion out there that uh, this is uh, perhaps in part at least uh, as a, a result of a collusion between Saudi Arabia, uh, which is uh, leading OPEC not to uh, reduce its output, and, uh, and the Americans who are considering, of course, uh, even stronger sanctions against Russia. Well, there's always a lot of conspiracy theories out there. I'm sure Russia may like that one. But, uh, you know, the reality is, I think, uh, you know, Middle East producers have been, uh, you know, they don't like the extra supply that's coming onto the market through oil shale, uh, etc. And I think they, they would like a period of low oil prices to, to take that uh, extra production out to ensure that uh, longer term prices for oil remain relatively elevated. Uh, but I think what we're seeing is, you know, oil is likely to say subdued for an extended period of time, whether it's sixty dollars, fifty, forty, whatever. The Russian authorities at the moment are facing a very, very big challenge, no doubt about it. Their reaction function, I think, the central bank has not done a particularly uh, great job in terms of responding to this. And you mentioned uh, one of uh, the other commentators mentioned the possibility of cabinet changes. It wouldn't surprise me if we saw changes at the central bank as a result of this, because the central bank, with 400 billion of reserves, 420 billion reserves, should not be seeing its currency drop 10% in a day. Actually, for two days, 10% per day. And uh, Martin, so dire is the situation economically in Russia, and Pavel has alluded to the possibility of there being a, a, a change of command uh, in terms of the Kremlin. Um, but would there be any any indication, any point at which uh, Vladimir Putin may change tack, may change his policy. I'm thinking, of course, about uh, Ukraine, because that, of course, has had a huge price, hasn't it? It's cost him dear. This is what the West would like, especially the Americans uh, and the European Union. <clears throat> they will uh, uh, sit on the sidelines and wait to see what Vladimir Putin does. What they would like to see would be a reduction in the defence spending, because defence spending has gone up 50 per cent in the, the last decade or so. And uh, they're involved in eastern Ukraine. Crimea is uh, going to be very expensive and so on. So they're hoping that uh, uh, Putin will draw in his horns, uh, perhaps say, right, the situation is so serious that uh, we will, in fact, allow eastern Ukraine to go its own way. We will not interfere anymore. Uh, and, but Crimea stays Russian. Uh, eastern Ukraine, OK. Kiev can, in fact, uh, reimpose its authority there. Now, the West would like that to, th to happen. But unfortunately, if that happens, if Putin did that, he would lose face. He would, he would be seen as a man who'd given in to the West. And it goes back to the old Soviet uh, problem. Any concession is considered as, uh, by the uh, Soviet population, the Russian population, as weakness. And the fear of the Russians is that if they make one step backwards, then the West will force them to take two steps backwards. It will be a continuing problem. So therefore, almost certainly, Putin will hunker down and he will say this, this problem uh, has been created by outside forces. It's not our problem. Our economy is OK. Uh, and we have to see it through. And we're not going to leave the uh, uh, pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine in the lurch. We're not going to give up on Ukraine, on, on Crimea. And uh, we're going to show the whole world that we can defend our own interests and so on. So uh, the only thing that will stop him uh, in his tracks will be basically a collapse in the currency, a collapse in the ruble. The central bank may be forced uh, to intervene eventually. But also, you have Russian companies like Rosneft and all the others. They have huge uh, hard currency dollar debts to pay before the end of 2015. They will all be asking for money from the central bank. Uh, and now Putin will then have the problem. Can we let these uh, companies go to the wall? Uh, and if we let them go to the wall, what effect will that have on the Russian economy, uh, on Russian labor, and so on? So uh, the problem is not at present. I see the problem as really coming to a head perhaps in six months' time. And Putin will then have to take some very, very hard decisions. Does he bail out uh, the oligarchs and the Siloviki and the strong people in Russia? Or does he let some of them go to the wall uh, in defense of Russia? And uh, Pavel, within the, uh, the, the Russian consciousness, um, 
are uh, people equating uh, the exploits in eastern Ukraine and indeed in Crimea, are they equating that with a lot of revenue? Well, of course, it's a scene as the hand of the West. I mean, that's not only what the Russian propaganda is saying, the state-run propaganda. That's what many people actually believe. They believe the Americans to be evil superheroes who can do almost anything and can change the price of oil and can make uh, currencies go anywhere they wish. Uh, so yes, that will be. This will be seen as a demonstration of American. Uh, uh, might and seen with a way and so this is going to create again problems I don't think that Putin is going to change I agree with that he will not most likely dramatically change his policies on Ukraine uh, but will be most likely much more cautious and will be right now right now the real decision he has to make and he has to do it now not in six months is to how to react to this uh, growing crisis because we're going to have uh, unemployment growing, GDP falling, um, unemployment especially in so small towns where people, they have one factory which may close down because uh, they can't pay their bills or they can't buy, th uh, they can't get credit because credit is too expensive. And how to deal with such situations, he has to have a plan, he can't just simply try and sit it out. And uh, Timothy, is there a uh, is there a, a, a white rabbit in a hat? Is there a silver bullet? Is there something that can be produced by uh, the Kremlin and the central bank that could derail this uh, impending disaster? Well, uh, I mean, it was mentioned earlier that I think a, a changes at the senior level of government. I mean, Alexei Kudrin was mentioned, very well-respected former finance minister, uh, a man who for a long time argued that Russia should plan for oil at $50 a barrel. Russia has a reserve fund and a national wealth fund, uh, an oil welfare fund, and it was basically Kudrin's idea. So, uh, you know, I think the markets would certainly like Kudrin's uh, uh, arrival back on the scene. If anyone could kind of provide some reassurance for markets, I think it's him. I, mean, I think one problem is, as I mentioned, I mean, the whole economic policy circle has been badly damaged now by this move in the exchange rate when it shouldn't have been this way. Uh, the, 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 the Russian authorities had plenty of tools, plenty of ammunition to prevent this. They let, let it get out of control, particularly the central bank. Uh, perhaps the Kremlin uh, uh, constrained them in terms of use of FX reserves. Uh, but I think, you know, the credibility is, is a, has been massively compromised. And, uh, you know, you need a, a new group of uh, policymakers, I would argue now. And uh, Pavel, can I come to you and ask you to be uh, pretty brief, because unfortunately we're running out of time, but um, I just wondered if you could uh, give me your thoughts on the words of uh, former Soviet President uh, uh, Gorbachev, who very recently talked about this being the start of a new Cold War era between Russia and the West. How, is that how you see it? Well, yes, and that's the real problem, because this is not just simply falling oil prices, and not only, of course, oil, it's also gas, it's also metals and uh, different commodities that Russia trades in uh, fertilizer. It's also that we have a problem with the West. We have Western sanctions on technology, which would be biting soon, and uh, sanctions on finance. We've been cut off from the uh, world financial market, where uh, Russian corporations have been taking lots of money they can't get the money, they can't operate as they did before. Uh, so this is all compounding together. It's a cumulative effect. And we have this new coming Cold War, uh, uh, arms race of sorts maybe, and that means cutting defense spending actually will be very damaging for Putin. He vowed that it will not change. Okay, I'm going to And have money to, has been investment in producing to. these new weapons. So we're getting into a situation where any, we're getting, it's going to be very, very hard and, to get out of this crisis. It's Pavel, going to be I have to, real I have serious to stop bad. you there. Thank you very much indeed. Pavel Felgenhauer, Martin McCauley and Timothy Ash. Thank you all. And a reminder that you can find this show and many more on our website, aljazeera.com. You can post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or you can always contact us, of course, on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm Martine Dennis. Thank you very much for watching. Bye for now.